uh, I knew that we, in, with this audience, I, do, I don't have to explain all the details how to get single cells and how to do uh, single cell sequencing. So I'm just jumping right into experimental designs and into data analysis. But if there's something unclear in between, feel free to ask. Um, so I will mainly talk about RNA sequencing. I feel a little bit off topic in this, uh, on this day and looking at the agenda and the next speakers, but I think it might also be the best introduction into the field of, of uh, single cell genomics to give you the, like, the broader overview. And I will mainly talk about experimental design because this is where the point where uh, computation biologists can come together with uh, experimentalists and can uh, avoid problems, artifacts, biases in the data from the very beginning to make sure that you create high quality data sets and to make sure that you can uh, get the best out of your data and for, for data interpretation and, and analysis. Um, so this is where our group is located. So we are part of the um, Spanish Nas National Center for Genomic Analysis, which is basically the, the national infrastructure for genome research. Uh, we form this infrastructure by doing sequencing. So we do kind of sequencing production service uh, for Spain, but also international products, uh, projects. And half of the, the, the institute is related to data analysis. So here we have our own supercomputer in house, but also a quick connect, connection to the Barcelona supercomputing center. And the idea is to, to provide like the full package of genomic analysis to the collaborate, collaborators where we create the data, but also produce it or uh, handle the data into a format where also labs without experience in bioinformatics can, can take their data sets and uh, uh, to allow them more useful interpretation even without uh, hardcore bioinform bioinformatic knowledge. Um, this is just to give you the, the general overview of uh, why we do what we do. I think it doesn't need to, to uh, uh, a more uh, deeper interpret, uh, explanation. So in the end, what we've done before by using bulk RNA or bulk DNA sequencing, we were looking at averages across populations, across monocrossing crossing cells, across populations, which allowed, allowed us to get like in a general overview of what we have in our sample, but it didn't allow us like a fine-tuned comparative analysis uh, for uh, across populations or, or cell types. So if we, if we look at the smoothie in the beginning with the bulk RNA sequencing, we we're extracting RNA and DNA from complex samples. Uh, the smoothie would allow us to get the general taste of our, of our sample, and we could maybe get uh, kind of a guess what flavors we have inside. But now with a single cell analysis, we are looking at the single fruits that are, into this, uh, that are in this smoothie and allow us to do a stratified analysis to look, uh, that allow us to, to look deeper into populations, co compare populations across multiple samples, and we move away from this average analysis that we had before. Uh, this is an example for peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So these are 60,000 PBMCs. And before, we were taking all RNA molecules within the sample. We are using this average, comparing them across populations, across conditions, patient samples, and so on. But now we would be able to, by looking at individual cells, to stratify or to, to group um, single cells into populations and do a more stratified analysis looking at single populations, but also uh, to compare single populations across multiple sam uh, samples. Um, for sure, you're very familiar with the plots like the TSNE plot. So throughout the presentation, I will have many of them here. We just put all the transcriptome information of single cells together in a two-dimensional plot where uh, uh, cells that are similar to each other are grouping together in populations. We then end up with cluster of, of, uh, cluster of cells. And looking at the cluster markers, we would then be able to annotate clusters to, to uh, certain populations. In this case, we would be able to annotate B cells, T cell types, natural killer cells, and so on and so forth. But we would be able, also able to zoom in a certain population to get a better fine-grained view of what we have in our sample. Um, as mentioned, I will mainly talk about experimental design and focus on the, the first steps of these processes. So in general, single cell transcriptome analysis can be grouped in four major steps where we begin with the sample preparation, uh, single cell capture, sample pr processing, library preparation, uh, primary data processing, and data analysis. And the main biases, artifacts that we produce are produced at the very beginning where we have, in the best case, we have our cells already in solution. So we have uh, blood cell types or 
uh, liquid biopsy biopsies where we take our samples, we isolate single cells, so we pass it through a filter, and we would be able to capture directly single cells into um, nanoreaction volumes. Uh, in, the, in the more difficult cases, which is quite kind of standard uh, for many projects, we have to digest our solid tissue, our solid tumor, bring cells or uh, disrupt cells from their natural uh, micro, uh, microenvironment, bring them into solution, and this process can introduce major biases in terms of cell composition, where tightly connected cells are not brought into single cell solutions, so we would lose them throughout the process, or we are treating our sample too, too harshly and we would disrupt more sensitive cell types, and in the final data set we would lose those samples uh, along the way, uh, lose those cell types along the way. So the next examples that I will give on the next slides will, uh, will show you examples how uh, cell type uh, biases can occur and also how gene expression profiles can get disrupted across this process. Because here, this is a very time sensitive, time and temp temperature sensitive process. If samples are not processed in a, in, a, in a rapid way, gene expression profiles can change. And we would not look at the gene expression profiles that are specific for the cell type or cell state, but rather we would look at technical artifacts introduced after the single cells were disrupted or were isolated from that tissue. I will briefly also talk about experimental designs in terms of data generation, so how we are able to generate single cell transcriptomes, what techniques exist, and we were benchmarking those techniques for their performance, especially in the light of single cell, uh, um, cell atlas projects. Um, so the, the, the major uh, presentation today will be uh, summarizing our work that we do in the Human Cell Atlas Project. I think I don't have to explain what this project is about. Uh, maybe just briefly, so we, we take the human body and the idea is to make like a Google, Google map system of each organ and cell lineage of the body. So we take millions of cells um, from mainly healthy donors. Uh, analyze them mainly by, at the moment, by single cell RNA sequencing to produce a cellular map of each organ and cell lineage that allows us later to, to be used as cell reference to project, um, for example, disease samples on top of it, but also to, to zoom in and out, uh, and out in sp of specific organs to allow uh, researchers to explore their organ of interest. Um, within this project, uh, within this project, we have like a uh, two-fold involvement. One is on the biolog biological end where we produce an atlas of the human B-cell lineage. So we sample more than a million cells from the human B-cell uh, lineage across different sampling sites of the human body. Then we are involved in the human kidney cell atlas uh, and also aim to be involved in the, in the pancreas cell atlas. But I will talk mainly today about our uh, implication in the standards and technology working group, because this, this is where we do uh, major work on, on benchmarking technologies and, and sampling biases. And this should be the main topic of the day. So here we are, uh, we're assembling different, um, uh, different members from different one institutes all over the globe. But uh, the main focus was that we were covering all major topics that uh, allow us to produce a human cell atlas. So at the moment, the focus is on, on single cell RNA sequencing because one of the field is moving there. We have scalable technologies. Uh, the data is very meaningful in the sense that we can get fine-grained pictures of, of organs and, and lineages. <clears throat> But this might be only the first draft of the atlas, and the second, uh, the second round might involve uh, more spatial transcriptomic uh, um, approaches where we put those single cells back into their, their tissue context to allow a spatial readout of, of the organs. Mm -hmm. But we're also now quickly moving towards uh, single cell latex seq applications to uh, do high throughput profiling of, of uh, open chromatin sites. This is driven by technologies because the technologies are there at the point at this point for single cell DNA sequencing, methylation, <coughs> or even protein, it's still more challenging. It's, it's partially possible, but it's challenging to scale those technologies to our thousands or even millions of cells. So it's kind of lacking behind at the moment, but I think in the next years we are, we are getting there. <coughs> so the, the mission of the, of the working group is to, to make sure that, the, that we're working on, on the latest technologies. So we scout and scale uh, upcoming or emerging technologies, not only for RNA-seq, but also for the other uh, modalities. 
with the final goal to produce uh, guidelines and quality metrics how to derive uh, a high quality uh, human cell atlas. Uh, with the overall, over, overall goals to, to produce an atlas that is reproducible, I think this is obvious. High integrity means that we are, we are kind of comprehensive, so we also identify rarer cell types and um, more subtle states that are, are present in those tissues, and to get an, um, like a complete and comprehensive view of, of, the, of the human organs. Predictive value means that we have a future uh, cell atlas that can serve as reference to project uh, um, future data sets on top to identify differences in cell composition and differences in cell state in the, states in the in expression profiles. So our, all this started when we were initially comparing uh, single cell RNA sequencing techniques Systematically, in a, together with the lab from the, uh, from the LMU in Munich with Wolfgang Ennert's people, where we used uh, mouse embryonic stem cells as source, uh, a sample source to compare, at this point, six different single cell RNA sequencing methods. Uh, these methods were passed through a unified pipeline, and we were able, by downsampling the same number of reads using the same uh, sample input, we were able to, to directly quantify differences in output of between these different technologies. Um, so you probably cannot read that well. So in yellow, we have uh, a SmartSeq, one of the most famous methods. Then along the way, we have other methods that are scalable, like uh, we have MarSeq here and we have DropSeq here. So these were the technologies that we had in hand by, by then. And we were uh, comparing them in terms of uh, accuracy and sensitivity. Accuracy means uh, how well they really reflect the transcriptome of single cells. So what we measure if that, that is real or not. And here we have R square of 0.8. So most of the techniques give us a pretty good readout about a single cell transcriptome. So what we measure is kind of, kind of accurate. However, uh, methods broadly differ in terms of sensitivity, meaning how many genes, how many molecules are picked up after sequencing. So, so what yeah. the truth uh, hmm? about the stuff that you compare against? This, so here we had spike ins, mm -hmm. so RNA spike ins. And the, one of the sensitivities used uh, is uh, determined by the number of molecules and genes detected in the mouse embryonic fibroblasts, and uh, mouse embryonic stem cells. And he, here, one of these is all downsampled. So each cell is downsampled to, to one million reads per cell. And here is one of these 8,000, 6,000, 3,000, 9,000. So you, you see already that the, that the methods are performing very differently in terms of how many uh, genes or molecules they detect at a given sequencing uh, depth. So while MarSeq is detecting around 9,000 genes, DropSeq and, oh, SmartSeq, so, sorry, the SmartSeq detecting 9,000 genes, and MarSeq and DropSeq are only detecting half of those. Meaning that with the same um, uh, budget invested in sequencing, we get half of the information out. And this is obviously a major decision point when we scale up uh, to many thousands or even a million of cells. So this was back then, published in 2017. Since then, the, the field evolved rapidly. So we now have like 20, maybe 25 different methods. And um, uh, in the framework of the Human Cell Atlas project, we now we were asking, OK, uh, we moved away a little bit from this homogeneous sample uh, source, as we had for the mouse embryonic stem cells. And we were aiming to define a, a sample that is, that is complex and is kind of ref reflecting of data uh, or reflecting data types that we will produce in the human cell atlas projects. And we were profiling the most common, in total, uh, 14 different methods. So this is the most com com uh, common methods that, are, that are, were available at this point. Some are plate-based, so cells are sorted into 96 or 384 uh, microtita plates. Uh, some, for some, cells are captured into, into nano wells. Uh, nano wells formats are uh, also scalable towards uh, thousands of cells, but the most common methods, and we had a few of them, are microfluidic systems where cells are captured in, into droplets. And uh, we were, we were, so this was done as a, as a multi-center effort. So we were um, designing the complex samples. We were uh, producing a, a, the, the reference sample. We were cryopreserving it, uh, and Ali quoting it in different, in different cryotubes and uh, sending those out to the different partners involved uh, in, in the benchmarking work. 
So the samples were sent out beginning of last year. Then middle of last year, we got the data back, and then we passed everything through a unified um, uh, pipeline to, to, to demultiplex samples, to, uh, and to map and, and quantify, ending up with two different uh, expression matrix, one for mouse and one for human, because our original samples were based on human peripheral blood monitor cells and mouse colon cells to kind of reflect two different scenarios. Uh, for, for complex tissues where the PBMCs are kind of um, uh, defined cell types are ordered into, into uh, clear cell populations and the colon is more a dynamic system where uh, we produce data that is more trajectory type and is defining different states along a differentiation process. Uh, both are real scenarios and uh, both are very common scenarios and with these complex samples we try to, try to simulate both of them. Uh, so then we looked, so we received the data, we passed it through the, through the common pipeline, and then we looked at common features, as done before in, in, the, in the studies that we published uh, in, in 2017. Uh, so we were again downsampling uh, data sets or cell types to the, different, uh, to, the, to the same sequencing depth, but before we were stratifying our complex samples into different, into different cell types, because we knew before that the performance of techniques is kind of cell type sensitive. So some cell types, um, some techniques perform better for larger cells with high RNA content. But whenever we go to smaller cells like B cells or monocytes or other blood cell types, uh, the, where we have less RNA content, it's much more challenging to produce complex libraries. And then uh, we were able to spot differences between the technologies. Uh, we did this stratification by producing a reference samples. So we, we asked the collaborators to sequence data sets to 3,000 cells and around uh, 250,000 reads per cell. Uh, and we produced a reference sample of higher than 40,000 cells where we, where we could easily identify the major subpopulations present in our data set. And we used a projection algorithm that, uh, that uh, took these as references, pro projecting the, the query data sets on top of it to identify the cell types, and then to do the analysis in a cell type specific manner. And these are the, 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 the previous defined uh, reads, re, uh, readouts. So here we again, it's a little bit unsharp. We have the number of detected genes now stratified by cell types and not across the, the complex sample. And you, you see that the, you have a vast uh, variability of of number of detected genes across, across those technologies. Again, they are downsampled to the same number of reads. So with the same uh, sequencing effort, we have uh, clear differences between technologies. Maybe just to name one, a few of them. So in yellow, we have QuadSeq2. It's a plate-based method developed at the Ricken in Japan. Uh, at the moment, it's only performed at the Ricken in Japan. So it might be a, a challenge to export that and to set that up in, in, in different labs. Uh, but we have other technologies like the 10x system here in, in, in brown, which is like a more automated system that you can, well, it's commercially available. Uh, it's broadly distributed over the field. It's well, at the moment the most, most common method that people use. And we see it's not performing much worse than the QuartSeq for larger cells. Slightly worse if you go to more challenging material, but still pretty good compared, compared to other systems. Here, the second best performing was the CellSeq2. Again, this is a method working in, in a plate-based format. It was one of the earlier methods that was then one of further developed, and it's quite a commonly used in the field um, where, one of where we still work in, 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 in the plate-based format. The, the former winner, the SmartSeq2, we have that was in, in pink. So we know we knew before it's 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 pretty good performing, but we see now it's it's not the best performing method anymore. So across the different cell types, so these are just examples of the human cell types, but we have different stratifications later. Uh, it's performing good, but it's it's more basically outperformed by by uh, by QuartSeq2, and also 10x is not performing much worse. So then we were. Um, performing uh, different downstream, downstream measures by, by further downsampling to different or even lower read, read depth. And again, QuadSeq stood out as far, far best techniques. And then we were looking at, uh, at gene markers and how, um, 
how methods perform in more uh, more analysis types where we really look at uh, at the interpretation of tissues. Uh, because in the end, we, we, take a, we take a data set, we cluster it, and to do the interpretation, especially for unknown tissue types, we need a deep resolution of, of marker genes to do, um, uh, to do interpreta interpretation, annotation, and maybe functional, functional um, annotation of, uh, of the cell types. So here we were cor correlating techniques against each other. So here, clearly, outlier was a chromium. So chromium is a 10x system, but working on single nuclei. So we had one method uh, comparing single nuclei, um, which is, again, a common scenario if it goes to more complex tissues like the brain, where we are not able to isolate uh, full cells, but we're only able to isolate a single nuclei because the outer membrane is dis disrupted through the, throughout the isolation process. And here we were, we were sampling basically RNA pool from the nucleus uh, and not the full cell. So we would kind of expect that, um, that these methods do not correlate well with the other methods. Uh, but throughout the, throughout the testing, the nuclear sequencing did not perform particularly worse than other methods, meaning it's, uh, it, it's different. It gives you a different type of information, but it's still very useful to do uh, cell type annotation and cell one maybe functional inference. Um, so looking at the, at the markers, here again is stratified by cell types and this, uh, the markers that define those cell types. We have uh, methods like one of SmartSeq here, uh, QuartSeq, uh, CellSeq2, detecting a, a, high, uh, uh, a high quantity of those markers. I have to say that most of the methods capture markers, so 80% of the markers were captured by all techniques. Uh, but you see obviously a big difference in terms of, in ter in terms of intensity. Uh, interesting for us was also the fact when we accumulated recounts across multiple genes. So this is zero, this is up to 50 genes, so we're basically accumulating uh, reads uh, across multiple cells. Uh, the cell seq 2 was performing particularly well, so meaning that uh, in, from the pool of sampled, of sampled molecules, uh, cell seq 2 is going deeper to deeper level and it's capturing more genes in total than other methods. Uh, when we compared the genes um, uh, detected additionally by cell 2 compared to the other methods, we've seen that those are more lowly expressed genes. So cell 2 might be better to capture uh, genes that have a lower expression levels and might give you a better resolution of, um, um, <coughs> of, of, of cells in tissues and might allow a better interpretation in the end. Um, so this is everything uh, plotted more, 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 more illustrative. So these are TSNE plots, again, on downsampled data for the different techniques. And you see well-performing techniques like Quartzig 2 here, where cells are. So now the color code is on the cell types. So here, uh, the clusters represent uh, cell types and states. And you see that Quartzig 2 is nicely able to separate uh, those cell types and cluster them in different ones. In different, uh, in different clusters, while other techniques like ScriptSeq or maybe also ILSA-8 give a much more blurry picture of your, of your complex tissue, which then in downstream analysis will give you a hard time to identify markers and to do uh, like a fine-grained stratification of your, of your sample. This is okay if, if you go for, or if you analyze PBMCs because you kind of know what you expect, but once you go for more complex tissues where you have no clear expectation, uh, a more blurry picture would not allow you to get to basically produce a, a high resolution atlas or later you lack markers and then annotation or function interpretation is very challenging. <clears throat> In the final step, we were aiming at integrating data sets um, into each other because in the end, the, the human cell atlas consortium is, is an open consortium so people can contribute. We can give guidelines what techniques perform best, but we cannot um, we cannot define from the beginning what, what techniques to use. So in reality, the cell atlas, the final cell atlas of the first draft will be a compilation of different data sets from different groups and across different methods. So we're, we're simulating this scenario here by then integrating the methods together in a common expression matrix. So you see we, we are able, by integrating those, uh, those 14 methods, to again have um, the cell type and cell state as first, 
as first uh, variable in the, in the data set, so we have clear separation of the cell types, although not as good as for single uh, good performing techniques. But then when we look into the cell types, we see that uh, particular techniques form particular niches, so meaning they're not fully integrating within, uh, within other data sets. And in a cell atlas consortium, uh, scenario, these would be methods that are not so easy to integrate with other methods and might be uh, not the best ones when aiming at a full one integrated atlas. Uh, particularly when a single nuclear sequencing stood out, so here in light in orange keys or light blue, this is kind of expected because we again see different, uh, we see, when we look at different information types, but also other methods were not as good uh, to integrate as others. Okay, this is now one of this uploaded to the Y archive and the data should be available in the next days. So the data, we tried to upload it to the human cell letters data coordination portal, but we had uh, dog cells spiked in and they at the moment only allow human and mouse. So we put it now at, at GO, but um, it should be available in the next days. Uh, our our uh, study was published back to back with a study from the Broad. <laughs> from Joshua Levins and Aviv Rijev's lab, where they looked at uh, kind of overlap, also it's a complementary study design, so it was coordinated through the working group. And in their study, they looked at additional techniques like uh, combinatorial barcoding methods, uh, but also SQL, so different uh, nano-world-based techniques. And they had a focus on single nuclear sequencing. So they had many of these methods applied for single nuclear sequencing, but in reaching similar conclusions where with the plate-based formats like smart six cells he give, uh, give us very good data. And uh, in the, for the microfluidic format, 10x was one of the, one of the win winners. Um, we, at this point, looked at the second version of the, of the 10x RNA-seq uh, chemistry. Uh, in the meantime, they released a third version, and in the second paper, they had a direct comparison between the second and third, and the third is even performing better. So you can already get the impression what technique might be, might be favorable to use in the, in the future. Um, okay, then... The, the, the second work I'd like to present is based on a work that we presented also in 2017, where we, where we assessed if cryopreserved material is, is, is capable to give us uh, viable cells and uh, sufficient and high quality material to, to do a single cell RNA sequencing. Because at this point, the, the notion was that we have to go to, for uh, fresh material, samples have to be processed as quick as possible. Um, but we obviously, being in Barcelona, we were like disconnected from, from groups in, in, uh, in Madrid or well, all over Europe. Uh, so we, we thought about a way how we can, how we can want to store samples and how we can transport them from, from A to B. And here we were looking at, at kind of standard cryopreservation. So we take our samples, we cryopreserve it in, in a DMSO type solution. Uh, these samples can then be stored at minus 80 or liquid nitrogen or shipped from, from A to B. And the cells that survive these freezing processes, so, so freezing uh, survival and viability after defreezing is very tissue and cell type dependent. So for blood cell types, this is easy to do and we get a, like a viability of higher than 90%. For other cell types, it's more challenging, so you really need to set up um, if, if you go to more like unknown or, or not previously tested system. But to make the long story short, uh, short well, cells surviving the freezing process had a perfect transcriptome. So we're perfectly defined to do a single cell RNA sequencing and comparing uh, um, fresh uh, cryopreserved samples stored at minus 80 or liquid nitrogen. So this is fresh minus 80 in liquid nitrogen. And you can walk through the, through the plots, they're kind of, uh, also giving the same message that cryopreserved samples give us the same uh, information content and are perfectly defined to do to do a single cell RNA sequencing and and one. Uh, yes. Yeah. Do you freeze the cell suspension here? I guess. Yes. What do you for the solid tissues? We mince the tissue and we cryopreserve the minced tissue, but we can also mince, digest, and filter, and it's giving us the same result. It's probably tissue dependent, so more sensitive tissues. I would rather mince and cryopreserve than mince digest because digestion already increased um, yeah, kind of cell damage that is then probably favoring the cell loss during the defreezing process.
So, but the cryopreservation is kind of um, uh, now one commonly used in the field, and we thought, okay, if we can cryopreserve cells, you can also go back to cryopreserve material that is already biobanked in in large in large large cohorts and in large biobank samples. Um, the problem there is that although there's a, like a common system to cryopreserve cells or to cryopreserve sample, uh, there's a there's a time differences between the sample was taken from the donor, from the patient, until it's cryopreserved. So it's a very common scenario that uh, a sample is taken in the beginning of the day, in the morning, and only cryopreserved in the afternoon. Uh, or it's shipped from Madrid to Barcelona, so it takes even 24 hours before a sample is cryopreserved. Uh, so we thought that this might introduce a major bias in the data, because if you have a sample taken out from a donor, from a patient, this should introduce a major change in the gene expression profile. Um, especially when samples are shipped at, at standard, uh, at, um, with a standard messenger. So at, at room temperature, we would expect that uh, cells are reacting to this stress. And we would expect like a uh, sampling specific um, a signature. So we were designing a study testing this systematically. So we took PBMCs, so we extracted uh, blood from, from donors, and we, we left the, the, so we either processed the drug, uh, the, the blood immediately, or we left it at the bench at room temperature for up to 48 hours. And we're sampling different time points. And this work worked by Ramon here in the audience. So if you have more, more questions later, you can approach him during the day. Um, so this is what we got. So we, we passed everything, different time points. So we were controlling for batch effect. All samples were processed in the same way, in the same 10x lane, in the same sequencing lane. And we were producing 10x data, so high throughput data, but also smart data, uh, where, we, where, we, where we could see cell and RNA integrity, where the RNA seems to be pretty intact. So there was no in effect on the cell or the RNA quality. The RNA expression profile was vastly different between, between the time points. So at, in gray, you have time point, time point zero, so freshly cryopreserved. At two hours in Turkey, it's still OK, so we don't see major effects. But then we have an effect that is uh, basically a gradient over the time points that we analyze. So after eight hours, we see already a major effect, uh, which is peaking after 48 hours, and so on and so forth. So we had different replicates, and you see the same across different, different cell types. If you zoom in, so here it's uh, T cells, monocyte, and B cells. Uh, but you can also go deeper into the, the subpopulation, and the sampling effect is basically present in all, of those, in all of those cell types. And then Ramon came up with the idea, OK, if we see the effect, um, can we correct for it? Because the biobank samples are already there, so there's no way to collect them again. So they're biobank cohorts with thousands of samples. It was a vast, uh, vast effort, and people have already major information on those samples. And so do, the question was, can we find a way to still access the sample and do like popula population-wide single-cell RNA sequencing analysis and correct for the sample biasing while analyzing the sample? So again, here we see the, the, the time-dependent bias. And then Ramon came up with a signature that is related to this bias. So there are common genes that are affected uh, across all cell types, but also cell type-specific signatures. Uh, some were clearly related to a response to, to, the, to the sampling. So here we had a gene related to one of response to cold. And also, this was a, one of the um, GO terms in, enriched across the signatures. So once we had the signatures, we could stratify our samples by being affected or not affected. So affected would be all, all the ones in the, in the colors here after eight hours. And this, again, the signature tells us it's a kind of time dependent. So we've seen an increase of the sampling score over, over the time points. And with this signature, we could, uh, we could predict which cell is affected or non-affected in our data set. And yes, uh, two minutes, really. Austria. <laughs> so I will stop after this. Um, so, and then, so once we know which cell is affected, we, can, we could use the signature to correct uh, our data set uh, in a way that we are regressing out the, the genes, uh, the gene signatures that, that were, were part of uh, one of these, uh, uh, the, this, the cell type specific signatures, and we were able to correct this effect. Uh, we, so this is done for, for our sample. We did it for also with using the same signatures for different technologies. So we profiled the same sample with a SmartSeq2. And our signature was able to correct the biases there as well. And now we are looking at, 
additional cohorts where we test the test the possibility that uh, our signature is able to correct also like foreign or future future data sets. Um, okay, so this were, was an option for samples that are already sampled, but for future study designs we thought okay it's best to avoid this uh, sampling effect from the very beginning. So we thought, okay, if we take a sample and we put it on ice, would that help to, to conserve the single cell transcriptome? And would that help uh, to allow to, to avoid those biases? And this is, this is what we, we've seen. So in gray now we have these uh, samples directly cryopreserved um, after sample extraction. And in light blue we have samples left for 40, uh, 24, 48 hours, but at four degrees. And you see that they almost perfectly clustered with a, with a freshly processed sample. And um, compared to the, to the samples left at room temperature, so for future study designs, this is uh, a viable solution to avoid sampling bias. Now we'll click, we quickly th click through the next slides, because this is a, sample, uh, a study done by the Sanger and EBI, uh, by the Sanger Institute and EBI, where they did or tested these sampling effect and storage on four degrees on different organs, so they, they checked lung, oesophagus, and spleen, and they left it up to 72 hours, but from the beginning at, at four degrees. And across many of the measures, they've seen that there's only a slight effect after 72 hours, so kind of mappability is dropping slightly, and only in the there was spleen. After 72 hours, we have slight increase in mitochondrial content after 72 hours, but otherwise all the measures tell us that the major variability is across patients. Uh, and that the time points are not affecting neither gene expression profiles or tissue composition. So for future study designs, we, uh, we, we, wanna, we recommend to be as quick as possible. And if we have to store samples, store it at, at four degrees, that would almost perfectly conserve your, your single cell transcriptomes. And now if you switch to the last slide. And thank my wonderful group. Thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. We have the winner defined at this point by, by technology that is scalable and that make it, made it to the market that most of the labs were picking up now. So it's a 1 at 10x chromium system, which is scalable, so you can do easily hundreds of thousands of cells. It's super easy to use, and it gives you very good data. And the problem here is my versions are changing. So last year version 2, now version 3, next month version 3.1. Uh, so we probably would have to catch up with the, with the versions, but we would generate data sets that are more comparable than uh, data sets um, produced across many different methods. Um, the, one of the winners defined today, but I think next year, in the following years, it will change, and we probably have to keep on updating uh, our guidelines, our standards, and yeah, it's, it's hard to foresee. Uh, where the field is moving, but we are aiming at always more cells. So now we can do 10,000, 100,000 of cells. We want to do millions of cells. So there will be techniques that are better scalable and cheaper, because in the end, the, the price is defining uh, what would be the, the winning technology. Uh, but at the moment, it's a 10x, which performs just pretty good and is pretty easy to use. Yeah. Okay. So thanks very much.